All right, well, let's get started. We've got our phrase of the day, kai ta loipa. Does anybody know what that means? It does mean etc. Who knew that, and why did you know that? Yes, it's in your book. Uh, sometimes it's, it's abbreviated kappa ta lambda. If you're reading older um, works in classics or in biblical studies or in theology, you'll often see that. Has anybody ever seen that in there before? It stands for kai ta loipa, which means and the remaining things, which in Latin is et cetera, abbreviated ETC. So there you go. That's the way they used to do it because it used to be that really educated people knew Greek not, and not just Latin. Then when educated people no longer knew Greek but just Latin, they started abbreviating it with et cetera. And now nobody knows Greek or Latin, except for y'all. Okay. <laughs> Some people know that it means et cetera, uh, but not everyone. Okay, so we're moving on to chapter 11, and here we introduce pronouns, okay? So you're still, you're still in third grade, but you're not doing nouns anymore. You're going to move to pronouns, okay? Um, so what's a pronoun? Where it takes place of a noun. It's a pronoun. doesn't mean it's a professional noun. It means that it stands in the place of a noun. Pro is the Latin preposition that means in place of. Um, there are a number of types of pronouns, and we'll be looking at these in subsequent chapters. The first one introduced is called the personal pronoun. What are our personal pronouns in English? Ah, uh, you, he, she, et, we, you, they. Um, pronouns like who are called relative pronouns or in, in interrogative pronoun. Um, so that we'll have other types to come later. Um, okay, so what does the pronoun refer to? What is that word called? Pronoun stands in the place of some noun. That noun that it stands for is called the antecedent, right? The word that comes before, literally. So if we say Kesha dances with her friends, they are who they are. Do we have a personal pronoun? Kesha dances with her friends. They are who they are. Any personal pronouns? They, okay? It's a personal pronoun standing in for some antecedent. What is the antecedent of they? Friends, okay? And that's how it works. Okay, so when we refer to person, there are three possibilities. First person, second person, third person. Who is the first person? Yeah, I, and technically it's the person speaking. The second person is technically the person spoken to, or you. And the third person is the person or thing spoken about. So it's he, she, or it. As in English, it inflects for gender, whereas I and you do not change by gender in English. And then the plural versions of each of these, plural of I would be we, I assume when you said me, you just you had your W flipped. Okay? The plural of you is you all or ye. Okay? All ye people. Third person would be they. Okay? So we have first, second, and third person. And again, when we refer to number, we're talking about Singular or plural. It's about how many we have. Okay, so again, our pronouns in English, most of them do not distinguish forms for gender. Only the third person singular does that. Okay, so some of these will change by case. So if we say he when we're using a subject, when it's possessive, it becomes his, and when it's an object, it becomes him. And you all understand these cases because most of us speak pretty good English, right? So we don't say, me am good at English, right? Why don't we say, me am good at English? Because me is the objective case, I is the subjective case, okay? All right, so let's move to the Greek pronouns then. We're only going to learn the first and the second person in this chapter. First person pronoun is su. 
In the singular, that's you. And for the plural, it's who mes. So you singular, you plural. Sorry about that. Back up the camera. Uh, first person is ego. Second person is hey mes. Second person, su, and in the plural, who mes. All right, hey mes, who mes, very often confused because obviously they're very similar. So what I'm going to do is pull up the full declensions. Because just like nouns, your pronouns are going to inflect in all five cases. Well, in this case, the vocative will not look any different. All right. You able to see that? So the first person singular, ego and the nominative, but then look at the rest. Do you recognize those endings? Mu, moi, me? Kind of, right? That kind of looks like the genitive you know and a dative you know. That doesn't really look like an accusative you know. These are the same. Some of them maybe look like they resemble things you've seen before, but a little different. What this means is that it's irregular and you have to memorize it as irregular, okay? These do not follow first or second declension. They don't follow a two on two pattern. Just think of them as irregular. So the way that uh, I've learned them is just to say them. Ego, mu, moi, me. Okay? Try it. Ego, mu, moi, me. Ego, mu, moi, me. Ego, mu, moi, me. Yes. Um, well, you want that to happen, right? You want to not be able to stop reciting declensions. As soon as you can do that, you've arrived and you're a Greek scholar. And I'll sign you up as a Greek tutor, okay? Um, in the plural, we, who mace, who moan, who men, who mas. Ready? Who mace, who moan, who men, who mas. Who mace, who moan, who men, who mas. Aaron only. Who mace, who men, who mas. All right, thanks. There you go. There's I, there's we. How do you learn it? By saying it over and over and over again until it's all you can think. Personal pronouns. All right, second person, you. Su, su, soy, se. Say it. Su, su, soy, se. Su, su, soy, se. Su, su, soy, se. Notice that it's pronounced the same in the nominative and genitive, but it's spelled a little differently. One thing to point out is these accented forms next to it. Those are alternate forms. You use the accented forms when you want to emphasize the pronoun. It's the emphatic form. That's the only difference. Okay, in the plural, who mace, who moan, who men, who mas. 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 We gotta get you guys like rowing ships to the declensions. Um, okay, and the third person we'll hold off on until a later chapter. Okay, and that's it. So how do you learn it? You just say it over and over until you're blue in the face. Okay. Um, and there you go. Any questions on the first and second person personal pronoun? Is this in the textbook? Yes. It's in the textbook. Chapter 11. Okay. The other thing from chapter 11 is additional third declension nouns. The endings are not going to be different from the ones you've already learned. But what's going to be different is the stem change patterns. Okay. Okay, here we go. It's coming. So we've done Anima and Sarks. Again, what are the endings for the third declension neuter? No ending in the nominative, no ending in the accusative, right? So, asi, aunsia. For the masculine or feminine, 
It's sacia esoncias. Sacia esoncias, sacia esoncias. So the uh, nouns introduced in chapter 11, it's the same endings, but again, it's just different stem change patterns. So what you've had, um, you've had neuter nouns with stem ending in mat, and you've had nouns with stem ending in a kappa. Now they introduce third declension nouns with stem ending in a ta or a, or a dental. So notice that the endings are the same. Saucy, but then what happens in the accusative? Remember that new is the alternate accusative singular ending. And where that's used depends on the ac where the accent falls, so maybe more technicality than you need, but that's the reason for it. And in the plural, as own sias. So in what two places do we find changes to the stem and why? The nominative singular, what have we lost? We lost a ta, why? Ta before sigma, it's afraid of sigmas. Okay, so it drops. And the same happens in the date of plural. Carat sin becomes carism. Okay, see how easy this is once you learn those basic principles. Third declension, neuter nouns with stem ending in a ta. Okay, technically there's no ending in the nominative and accusative, right? That looks like that's a case ending, that's sigma, but it's not. That's actually just the original stem. And you've added a ta for, again, reasons you don't need to go into. But it's no ending, asi, no ending, aonsia, where you've lost your ta in the date of plural before the sigma, right? So would the medical manual regarding apostasy stuff, could we do in the phrase of like that? In the yeah, you don't have to use parentheses. You can just put new. That's fine. But it might not hurt in your practice to leave it there, just to remind yourself that it's movable. Yeah. If you ever wanted to, and the conditions were right, you could move it. Yeah. All right. Now, third declension ending with stem ending in a delta. What's happened in the nominative singular? Delta before sigma is dropped. And in the date of plural, delta before sigma dropped. Otherwise, it's just what you'd expect. Sasias oncias. One that's slightly different is this kind. The stem originally ended in a consonantal yoda. Did you know that was a letter? That used to be a letter in the Greek language that dropped out at a very early period. And because it dropped out, it caused all these morphological changes in words. So on third declension nouns of this type, what happened is that it caused the stem vowel to alternate throughout the declension. But can you figure out a pattern that tells you when it's going to be Yoda and when it's going to be Epsilon? It has to do with uh, what letter follows. You use Yoda before a consonant and Epsilon before a vowel, with one exception, the date of plural. There's an exception there. But I think that's the easiest way to remember the vowel alternation. I before a vowel, or Epsilon. I'm sorry, Yoda before a consonant, Epsilon before. Uh, a new I before E rule? Uh, sure, yeah. Yoda before a consonant, epsilon before a vowel. Okay. And that's a kind of weird accusative, isn't it? So, pistis is a little bit more difficult. And to give you a quick explanation of pater, here, what's your stem? You have to go to the genitive and drop the os and there's your stem. When you do that, pi, alpha, tau, rho, but as you look through you notice it's not consistent, right? This is what we call um, a blout. A blout. A blout is when you have a change in the vowel grade. Either a short becomes long or a long becomes short or the vowel just drops out. It's called the short vowel grade, long vowel grade, and zero vowel grade. Um, so just sometimes when you see these changes the answer is a blout. So if you, if, you're, if you don't know why something's changed, when in doubt, it's a blout, right? Okay, so here, long vowel grade, pater, zero vowel grade, pater, and then here, short vowel grade, pater. But that's really all that's varying, is the vowel grade. How would you pronounce this? Well, it depends on which one it is. It's, yeah, it's pater or pater or pater, right? You just... Have to practice with it. Patera, patras, patri, patera, pateras, patero, and patrasa, pateras. And do, is there several that follow that pattern, or is this one just in a row? 
know, there are others that follow that pattern. Mater is the word for mother. Mater also does that. And that's the thing with these is these are paradigmatic. So there are other nouns that follow these patterns. So hudor, hudatas is a little bit more difficult pattern too. Um, and one that I'd, I'm not, never going to test you on. Okay. So I, I show you these, show you it looks maybe a little bit intimidating, all these changes. But really, it's these regular rules, right? A dental before a sigma drops, a new before a sigma drops, a ta at the end of the word drops. And otherwise, you're just using your regular ending, sasia as oncias. How else can you remember these stems? Well, if you're learning your vocab and you learn this word as ha pater patras, ha pater patras, ha pater patras, and you've got the genitive, drop the os, you've got your stem. Right? Same rules as before. Okay, other questions on this? Like, why is this so awesome? Abby was going to ask that. You still can. Why is this so awesome? Because, yeah, Jessica, <laughs> because what? Because repetition. Or you, or you practice repetition because it's awesome. Yeah, it's one of those philosophical, which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Um, okay. So with gender on third declension nouns, remember, they can be masculine, feminine, or neuter. And it's not that easy to predict. There are certain classes of stems that tend to go with one or the other, but I don't expect you to memorize those. So you're just going to have to memorize your article with your vocabulary words. Okay. Let's look at our vocab. On page 96. So remember, you're making flashcards, right? It's the best method for learning vocabulary. It might take longer. It might not take you as long to just look at the list before the quiz. But guess what? You're not going to learn them as well, right? Philip, Philip knows. He's taken Latin. He's taken Latin. Now he is making flashcards in Greek because he knows. It's the way. Okay. So article, then nominative, then genitive. So ha adolfas adolfu. So Adelphas, a brother. What's Philadelphia? Yeah, it's the city of brotherly love. Okay. On? One of my favorites, an untranslatable, uninflected particle used to make a definite statement contingent upon something. It's like, please stop talking. <laughs> um, it's, it does mean something. Um, usually it makes something indefinite that's otherwise definite. So when versus whenever. You guys notice this? In Texas, I'm not from Texas, so I noticed this when I came. But people mix up when and whenever, right? What's the difference? When do you use whenever? Whenever is talking about, you know, whenever Some undefined time, right? When? A specific time. So people say, um, last night, whenever I got home from work, I put some, well, do you know what time you got home from work? If you know what time you got home from work, then it's not whenever, it's when. Okay? But that's what on does. Uh, if you put on on hata, hata means when, hatan means whenever. However, Koine Greek speakers were just as bad at grammar as Texans, apparently, because they interchanged the two. So that rant was all for nothing. Okay. So, like, where are you from? Um, I'm, from <laughs> I'm from Virginia. Yeah, it's respectable, right? <laughs> it's the city of um, lovers. Virginia is for lovers. That's, that's the motto. I don't know why. But I once, I once met the person whose dad came up with it, and they couldn't explain it either. So, all right. Ready? Ha aner andras. So we get all kinds of stuff from this, right? Anthropology actually comes from this, right? The study of humanity. This, so it, it's the word that can be used for a man or a male. It's also the word that can be used um, for husband. Um, and you just have to decide based on context which it is. Okay? Androgynous, right? What does the word androgynous mean? 
Male and female, because we the word gune means woman or wife. So andra jin, it's from gune. So male and male and female, or ambiguously male or female. Okay, hey ecclesia ecclesias. So again, just a little um, excursus on this. If you've ever been at church and you've heard your pastor say, the church, it's ecclesia. It's the ek. Klesia. Wait, what does ek mean in Greek? Out of. What does kaleo mean? You may not know this yet. It means to call. So what's the ekklesia? The called out people. The people who are called out. Guess what? It's incorrect. That's not why the church is called the church. Maybe secondarily we can say that makes some sense. But the ekklesia is an assembly. And in ancient Greek society, in the classical period, um, the assembly of citizens, of, of a polis, of a city, would be called the ecclesia. So it's an assembly. What happens is that when the Greek translation of the Old Testament begins to refer to the congregation of Israel, sometimes it would use the term ecclesia. So what happens is it begins to have a theological connotation, right? What was originally a political term. So then when the church begins to use it for their assemblies, and you have even more theological connotation to it, but it was originally a political word, meaning an assembly of people. All right. Hey, Elpis, Elpidos. Hey, Elpis, Elpidos. Exo. Exo. Epi. Epi. Don't forget to learn what it means with each case, so put that on your cards. Hey, Mace. Ta Thelema, Thelematos. Ida. Edu. Kalas kale kalon. Hey, mater matras. Mater. Mater. Not mater. Okay? He's not mater. This is my mater and father. Um, okay. All right. Uda. Ha pater patras. Hey, pistis pista us. Ta hudor hudatas. Who that? Hey, who mace? Tafos photos. This is where we get the word photon, right? Photon of light. Hey, karis karitas. Huda. As in, there's a marker, huda. All right, so look, you're jumping up this time. 60.80%. Okay, now you know well over a half of the words in the Greek New Testament. Seriously? Seriously. And, and, and. and, and, the, 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 and, and, the. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I mean, if we keep doing this, it's only going to take 10 more chapters before you know 100%. So, how do you think Huh? How high is the book over 10,000? About 80. Yeah. Why? Because you don't get all of it? Well, you only learn 319 words in the book. You learn 319 words, but it accounts for over 80%. It's in Greek 3, man. Yeah, that's why you got to take Greek 3. If you feel cheated, Greek 3, and look, I'm just stringing you along. Okay. Wait, so can you answer, why are there a thousand flashcards? Because he's giving you the next 700 after the first 300 in the book, yeah. Well, here's, here's what happens, okay? There's a, there's a book that just gives you a complete list of all 5,000 plus words. If you look at it, it, they were organized by frequency from the article and Kai all the way down to words that occur two and one times. If you open up to the middle of the book, the very middle, and look at the last half, how many times do those words occur? Two or one time. Half of the words occur only one or two times. Um, so you reach a point of diminishing returns, right? Once you've learned everything that occurs five or ten times, really even by the time you learn everything that occurs 15 or 20 times, you know the vast majority of the words on the pages of the New Testament. Um, I've gone down to words occurring five times or more, plus scattered words that occur less than that. Um, but it's just not worth your, try, your time to try to keep up recollection of words that occur once or twice. When you have to go through thousands of them. Yeah. So in different Greek classes, where we continue to learn those 
Mm -hmm. Or like when we're translating, we'll push out a dictionary for just one word or something like that. Yeah, I think my philosophy is that the more vocabulary you learn, the more enjoyable and the faster your translation will become. So Greek 3 will add another 400 words. So you'll know about 750. And then in, because we'll do 320 this year. We learned 320 in Greek 1 and 2. It's really not that, it's really not asking that much. It's really not. But, and then we add another 400 in Greek 3, and then about another 250 in Greek 4. So if you do four semesters, you've got 1,000 words, which takes you down to everything occurring, I think, 12 times or more in the Greek New Testament. So, there were two words. We added a new word for good. Kalas. Yeah, um, the first one we had was agathos, right? So agathos has more to do with moral good. Kalas has a little bit more to do with what is beautiful, right? So they can both mean good, and they can both even mean morally good. But one shades more towards moral, and one shades more towards the beautiful. So for Kalas, yeah. we should focus more on the beautiful part. Than yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let's do your workbook here.